I'm Susan Kaplan, and I work in the news department at WGBH, and I am extremely happy today to be having a conversation for all of us with Helen Benedict. She is a professor of journalism at Columbia and the author of many books, fiction and nonfiction. Welcome, Helen. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Before we talk about some of your books, I would love to find out why it is that you began to write about the Iraq War and veterans and became so passionate about continuing to do this through your new book today, which remains about this subject. I, it began when we invaded Iraq in 2003, March, and um, I had done enough reading to know that Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with Osama bin Laden 9-11 or had indeed as monstrous as he was to his own people, had not even done anything to us. And I just felt uh, compelled as a writer to use my, my main tools, which are my writing skills, to, do, to address this. So I began to seek out the, some of the very first veterans coming back from the war, quite early on, about a year into the war. And um, I found them at vigils for the dead. I found them in classrooms speaking to to civilians trying to explain what was really going on on the ground in a way that the press and TV in this country were not covering. And in that adventure, that sort of exploratory adventure I was having at first, I very early on met my first woman soldier. She was standing silently in the back of a classroom while the men were telling stories about Iraq, being in Iraq, fighting there. So I went up to her and said, are you a veteran too? And she said, oh yes, I was in Iraq for 11 months. I was a gunner. But when I talk about it, nobody listens. Nobody believes me. And you know why? Because I'm a female. As I interviewed all those women, and I interviewed some 40 who served in Iraq, the thing that really got to my heart, that compelled me to keep writing about them, was how idealistic they had been. You know, they were very young, most of them. Some of them were career soldiers, but, or Marines. but. Um, and they'd gone in really believing that they were going to help Iraqis liberate them, liberate the women, build schools for children. That's what they were being told. You know, and there's something about the idealism of a young person that's very beautiful. Uh, we all want that in our young people. But their idealism was being smashed, or had been smashed by what had actually happened to them in the military and in the war. And that, that was so heartbreaking to me. And that's, that's what compelled me to keep writing about this initially. And then when I began meeting Iraqi refugees, I was, of course, extremely moved by what they'd been through and their courage and resilience and generosity. And so that's what's kept me going, even though the subject at times is very bleak. But um, are women still isolated and persecuted sexually in the military? You bet. Um, you know, there's still, I think, f maybe 14%. It varies on the, mm -hmm. depending on the year, but between 14 and 17% of the military are women. And they're, if they're deployed, they're not deployed together because they're women. They're deployed according to their job. So very often they serve alone or with only two other women or three other women, you know, and dozens and dozens of men. Um, and the military is a very traditionally misogynist culture, um, and thus they are subject to harassment and assault in, in terrifying numbers still to this day. And so you have chosen to write books, nonfiction, and fiction as a way to illuminate and try to bring their stories and to bring this reality into the, I assume, civilian population. Yes. How has that gone? Do you feel that the message has been heard? Um, by people who read my book, definitely, my books. Um, I do think that we exaggerate the gap between military and civilian. There is, there's a, it's this assumed that civilian people will never be able to understand what someone's been through at war. It's so assumed that there are jokes about it. And um, I challenge that assumption. But I think it takes a little work on our part, on the civilians' part. What can we do? We can read. I mean, the, the memoirs and novels especially, more than journalism, I believe, um, 
can bring us into the hearts and souls of soldiers and civilians who go through war. Now, this book, which is, I believe, the second in what is going to be a trilogy of books. We hope. We'll see. We <laughs> hope. We'll see. Can you tell us a little bit about why you chose to talk about and have these characters, which, by the way, wolf season does indeed mean that there are wolves in this. You have yes. a character who's very close to wolves. Why did that, how did that happen? Yeah. And what does that have to do with, you know, veterans in the military? Right. Um, well, the book is very much about how war, the experience of war, whether you're a civilian or, or uh, a military, goes beyond actually being in the war, how it reaches into your, in touches everyone who loves you, everyone in your community, it can reaches through your town, the rest of your life, your children's lives. Because that's where we are now very much in America. I mean, we've still got troops, of course, in both Afghanistan and Iraq, but not anything like as many as we did earlier. And so where, whereas we have millions of veterans um, dealing with the, with the ripple effect of war. So, that, so it's set in a small town in upstate, a small rural town in upstate New York, and it's about a group of people women, children, a couple of men who have all been affected by the war. Um, one is a veteran herself. Um, she's the one with the wolves uh, and a daughter. One is the spouse, the wife of a deployed Marine who's in Afghanistan, who's raising their son pretty much on her own because he's away so much. And one is an Iraqi refugee with her son um, who, who was in uh, San Queen which was set in Iraq, and she's now a refugee these some um, seven years later. What are some of the ways in which they can hope to be understood by each other? And how do their lives intersect in both the fiction of your world and what you might think is hopeful and positive for our very real world? Right. Um, well, one of the discoveries uh, I made early on in my research is that uh, quite a lot of soldiers have helped their Iraqi uh, interpreters come over. And I'm very fascinated by that relationship, you know, that I've even heard of soldiers um, making quite a lot of sacrifice to bring over there, in including marriages breaking up over it, you know, bringing over their interpreter and their interpreter's family because they feel such a deep loyalty. So, so there we have um, people who are supposed to sort of be enemies who are actually instead are tightly bonded. And I, I, like, I like what that says about human nature. You know, I think that is actually encouraging. But also, since I started writing this book, of course, there's been Syria happened, and um, this explosion of refugees all over the world, and now the villainizing of refugees, especially Muslim refugees, um, which we're hearing from the government and we're hearing from many groups. Uh, especially, you know, um, white supremacist groups. And I, th so I now feel it's extra important to have fiction out there, literary fiction about someone like Naima, um, to remind us that we're all human together. My experiences with interviewing veterans for many, many years, particularly from the wars in I Iraq and Afghanistan, has always, um, shown me that the the experiences that many of these many of these young men and women have is that they become close in a way while they are deployed much like previous wars that they miss when they come home yes and that it's very hard to find civilians who they believe understand i think we are too determined to believe that they that we cannot understand each other and as long as we're entrenched in that assumption, we're not going to be listening to each other. Um, I do understand that a lot of veterans don't want to talk about some of the horrors because they want to protect people they love from the traumas that they've gone through. They don't, they don't want to spread the horror to their families and their children and their loved ones. And that's very understandable. Um, but I think as civilians, we should be always ready to listen and not to judge. You know, 
if we are horrified by what we're hearing, remember that they're horrified too. You know, that they're struggling with, I f might feel really guilty about something I've done. I might feel as if war had turned me into a bad person and I'm struggling to find out how to be a good person again. I think that is one of the most heartbreaking struggles that many, many veterans I've met are having. I think it's the listening, it's the willingness to listen and let's stop assuming that we can never understand each other. Human beings have something called imagination. We also have something called empathy. Those two go together. So if we get out of our own little skins and our own little worries and think for a moment about what it was like to be that person in that situation, we might start understanding more. Well, I cannot thank you enough. I would encourage everybody to read Wolf Season. It is a way, as Helen Benedict has said so beautifully, to listen to and understand the lives of millions of veterans who are living amongst us uh, today, right now. Thanks so much.